Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Thanks everyone for being here today for this webinar presented by Behavioral Economics and Action at Rotman in partnership with the Behavioral Science and Policy Association. This is our seventh webinar of this academic year. My name is Patrick Rooney and I'm a second year PhD in strategy at Rotman, a VARE research coordinator and the moderator for today's webinar. Behavioral Economics and Action at Rotman, or BEAR, is a research center at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management, whose three programmatic missions are to research, educate, and engage in meaningful outreach with our academic, governmental, and industry partners. These monthly webinars are our way to hear firsthand from academics and practitioners who are making a meaningful impact in the world of behavioral insights, in particular, behaviorally informed business and evidence-based public policy. We are delighted today to have Spike Lee, Assistant Professor of Marketing here at Rotman, who will be talking to us today about how sensory cues shape our goal pursuit, decision-making, and policy preferences. Before I introduce Spike, I'd like to go over the ground rules for this webinar. Following this introduction, our speaker will deliver a 35-minute presentation. During the presentation, please submit our questions for our speaker by clicking the chat tab at the top right of your WebEx screen and typing into the entry box. These questions will be visible to all the participants. At the end of the talk, and with time permitting, we will have a question and answer session in which I will select questions from the chat tab to ask our speaker. <clears throat> As a side note, please only use the Q&A tab for WebEx connectivity issues. Please send technical Q&As privately to Liz Kang, our WebEx technical guru. So with that out of the way and without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Spike Lee. <clears throat> Spike Lee is a social psychologist with interests in philosophy of mind and cognitive sciences. He indicates how constructs fundamental to social life, such as morality, trust, suspicion, and love, are represented and processed in the human mind. He finds that physical cues like bodily cleanliness and fishy smells exert causal influence on people's moral compass, decisional bias, and economic behavior, even if they are met merely metaphorically related. Currently, Spike is building and testing a comprehensive framework for conceptualizing the precise mechanisms underlying mind-body relations. Thanks, Spike, for being here today, and take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much, Patrick, for the introduction, and also uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here as a presenter. For those of you who are just joining, in case you were looking for, hoping uh, for the director uh, from New York City, I apologize that I'm not exactly him. Um, I know I look very much like him, but no, that's a different person. So here I am. I'm at Rotman as a marketing faculty member. And what I do is um, not exactly making movies, but movies, but rather running experiments that are maybe like mini movies, if you will. So what I'm interested in is how sensory cues can shape our goal pursuits and decision-making processes and also sometimes influence policy preference. Um, so with that, I want to highlight today the power of sensory cues in a, new, in a number of domains, basically. So let me start by telling you some truism in psychology. One of the many truisms in psychology is that cognition is motivated. What I mean by that is that motives can get the mind going. And this is something that I think you can easily relate to if I use a simple example in daily life. Uh, imagine your colleagues are talking behind your back and you find out that they're talking behind your back. What's going to go through your mind right at that moment when you find out that they're talking behind your back? Well, chances are you wonder, wait, why, why are they talking behind my back? And what are they saying about me? Are there some malicious intent going on there? So essentially, suspicion in your mind triggers very active speculative cognitive processes, right? And this is one of the many examples where motives can strongly get the mind going, a powerful influence of motives on cognition. What I want to do in my research is to look at how sensory cues can trigger and shape motivated thinking in different domains. What do I mean by sensory cues? Well, there are many of them, and Patrick mentioned a couple of those. For example, I've looked at how cleansing experience, physical cleanliness, which we experience every day, washing your hands, taking the shower, um, and so on, right? How does that kind of daily life experience of cleanliness influence our motivated thinking? Another example is fishy smells, and I'll talk more about why I think, you know, fishy smell has a particularly interesting kind of metaphorical influence in just a second. And also, even um, flu season, when you hear somebody sneezing and coughing next to your desk, how does that shape the way 
you're motivated to engage in certain types of cognitive processes. And I'm going to argue that all of these sensory cues can trigger and shape motivated thinking via metaphorical meanings. And I'm going to use three themes to illustrate that idea, and also via overgeneralized feelings. And that'll be the fourth theme of my talk today. So these four themes are going to be basically about first cleansing, how cleansing can enhance people's flexibility in goal pursuit, and also how people regulate the dissonance experience in decision-making processes. How fishy smells can influence people's economic exchange behavior in behavioral economic gains, and also enhance people's ability to detect errors in reasoning. And finally, how sneezing and coughing by someone in the environment close to you can influence your own risk perception and therefore your policy preference. So let's jump right in with the first theme, flexibility in goal pursuit. What I want to argue is that if you analyze these physical experiences in detail, so think about the physical properties of cleansing, I think we can appreciate that it functions as what I'd like grounded procedure of separation. So imagine, think about hand washing as one uh, simple example, right? There are several key elements involved in the process of hand washing. is separating traces of past experience from the present target. In other words, in physical cleansing, you are detaching things like grease after eating or dirt after gardening from your own hands. Based on cognitive psychology research, we know that physical experiences can scaffold, can support, can ground mental experiences. So I'm arguing the physical, the physical experience of cleansing, separation, can ground the mental experience of psychological separation, meaning the association of guilt after immoral acts or distance after free choice from your own sense of self. Now to test this idea, this key proposition, which is that cleansing can function as a grounded procedure that separates traces of the past from the present, what I've done is looking at goal flexibility, goal pursuit uh, experiences in daily life. And you can summarize this basic idea of separation metaphorically in, in terms of wiping the slate clean. People, when, when you say, you know, let's just wipe the slate clean, essentially what that means is let's not worry about the past. Let's move on, have a new beginning, a fresh start, right? That's what I'm trying to convey here, separating past experiences from the present sense of self. So to test this idea, in the first study, we look at goal accessibility. So the basic argument is that if cleansing can separate past goals from the present, then goal accessibility from the past should be reduced by cleansing. So here's what we did in a, uh, in a simple experiment. First, we had people unscramble six sets of five words. These words are trying to prime the goal of academic achievement. So these were done on students, undergraduate students. So, uh, so we give them these five words, four high aim, high GPA, and the task was simply pick four out of those five words and um, form a coherent grammatical phrase. So aim for high GPA, for example. So these are basically words related to the theme of academic achievement. Afterwards, we told them we are also doing a consumer survey, and so we want you to basically tell us how you think about this product, evaluate this consumer product. Everyone got the exact same product, which was antiseptic wipes. Half of the people were asked to examine the wipe. The other half were asked to actually use it and then evaluate it. Right? Finally, we asked people to complete 18-word fragments, which is a way that psychologists have used to measure um, unconscious activation of concepts. So here's how we did it. Six of the words had to do with the focal goal that we primed earlier, so the goal of achievement, such as being the best. Six other words had to do with a conflicting goal. So indulgence, when you're trying to be achieving, focus on work, you try not to think about these indulgent things like having fun or going to quality. So the focal goal should suppress conflicting goals according to the goal activation literature. And finally, as a control measure, we also measured people's um, accessibility of unrelated goals, such as being a nice person, uh, like in the word kind, right? So these six, um, three sets of six words basically tap into different kinds of um, content accessibility. So on the x-axis, you see these uh, three different kinds of uh, words, and these were done within the subjects. And then y-axis is the number of words completed. Examining wipe using wipe between subjects, okay? So let's see what we found here. The focal goal of achievement, 
becomes a little less accessible if people use the wipe to clean their hands than if they simply examine the wipe without cleaning their hands. In contrast, the conflicting goal of indulgence becomes more mentally accessible if people use the wipe to clean their hands. The unrelated goal of being nice is not affected at all by the cleansing manipulation. And this overall pattern, this two-way interaction suggests that we are activating goals and we are using cleansing to influence goal, uh, mental accessibility of goal concepts. But that's just about sort of how the mind works. Now let's look at actual behavior, goal pursuit behavior as an, un as an outcome or a consequence of the mental accessibility of goal concepts. So here is a slightly more complicated design, it's a two by two design. First, we ask people to unscramble either health-related words, such as being healthy is important, uh, or in a neutral condition, control condition, they were just unscrambling these neutral words, like this ball is blue, doesn't really activate any particular goal. And then cleansing manipulation again between subjects. And then we ask people to tell us their current mood and how much they enjoyed the word task earlier. Basically, we just wanted to make sure that the subjects across conditions were reporting similar degrees of positive and negative mood and similar degrees of enjoyment of the word task. And indeed, they were basically at the same level. Now, subjects thought that that was the end of the experiment, except that that wasn't really, because at that point, the experimenter would come in and say, um, that's the end, thank you very much for participating. And as a token of appreciation for your time, um, there are some you know, goodies in the basket over there. So just pick one as you leave. Thank you so much again, have a good day. Now, what they chose from that basket of goodies was the dependent measure. There were two kinds of candy bars there. Granola bars, 90 calories, or the chocolate bars, 250 calories. If they chose the 90 calorie granola bar, that would be more consistent with the health goal that was primed at the beginning of this experiment. So this choice behavior was our dependent measure, which is what you see on the y-axis, the percentage of subjects who chose the granola bar rather than the chocolate bar as a free gift. So if we primed the health goal, and if they use the wipe to clean their hands, they are much less likely to pursue health behavior, to choose the healthy option, than if they simply look at the wipe. But if no particular goal was primed, then using versus examining the wipe doesn't significantly influence the choice tendency. And this two-way interaction suggests that whatever goal you prime, the goal pursuit behavior is reduced if people engage in cleansing because it separates the past goal from the present. Then we got curious. Well, if, if it is the case that cleansing can separate the past from the present, then what might happen to people's mental state after cleansing behavior? That's what we wanted to look at in this third study on goal importance judgment. So it's again a two by two design. First, we had people unscramble either health related words or saving related words. So health goal, saving goal. And then again, cleansing manipulation. And then unscrambling saving or health words. So basically, it's an order manipulation. They were either primed with health goal first, saving goal second, or saving goal first, health goal second, right? Finally, we just asked them to rate the importance of a bunch of goals. To what extent do you think the following activities is important to you, including things like eating healthy food, being healthy, obviously that's about health. These two items are highly correlated, so we average them. And then saving money, which is obviously about saving goal, embedded in a bunch of filler items that we don't care about. Okay, so let's see what we found in this study. Y-axis is the goal important, and there's saving goal and uh, the health goal. And remember, the order of priming those goals differs between subjects, one first, the other second. Okay, so let's first look at the subjects who simply examine the wipe without using it. Among these subjects, the health goal was rated as fairly important regardless of when it was primed. The saving goal, same thing. No significant difference depending on the order. So it was just rated as fairly regardless of whether it was primed before or after the, cleanse, uh, after the examining wipe manipulation. But if you look at the subjects who used the wipe to actually clean their hands, now the pattern looks very different. The health goal was rated as much more important if it was primed after the cleansing manipulation than before the cleansing manipulation. As a conceptual replication of this idea, the saving goal was also rated as more important if it was primed after the cleansing manipulation than before the cleansing manipulation. So the interaction patterns here suggest that 
basically, regardless of the goal content, if you prime it before the cleansing manipulation, it's less important afterwards. If you prime it afterward, after the cleansing manipulation, the goal becomes more important. So let me summarize these findings for you in this package of studies. Physical cleansing has been shown to reduce the mental accessibility, behavioral pursuit, and the judge importance of a previously primed goal, regardless of goal content, which is consistent with our argument that cleansing functions as a separation procedure, separating anything from the past from the present, regardless of the content. But also, for the first time, we're seeing evidence that cleansing can amplify the judge importance of the subsequently primed goal. And this, to the best of our knowledge, is the first evidence that cleansing can change your mental state afterwards. So the experience that you have after the cleansing experience, that becomes more influential to your mind. So these ideas suggest that cleansing can enhance people's flexibility in goal pursuit, um, stopping the pursuit of, you know, older goals and engage in new goal pursuit behavior. Now, what about decision making? If cleansing indeed functions as a procedure that separates past from present, it might help people deal with the dissonance from a recent decision making behavior. And so we use a very classic paradigm in the decision making world. Uh, this is called the free choice paradigm. And this is um, the original kind of study um, and we modified the materials in the study so that they are more relevant to 2000 and uh, to, to basically the 21st century. Okay, so the basic procedure goes like this. Subjects would be given 10 CDs to rank based on their own preference. So number one would be the favorite, number 10 would be the least favorite number CDs. And these are not my rankings, just to be clear. Justin Bieber is fine, just not my number one, but whatever. So these are the rankings, hypothetically. So they, after they do this ranking task, they would be presented with two CDs to choose from. The experimenter would say something like, um, as an appreciation for your participation, we have sponsor, um, uh, sponsors here who can actually give three CDs. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit low on stock right now. So these are the two CDs we have at the moment. Would you like to choose one to take home with you right away? Now, these two CDs that we offer them were always the two CDs um, that were ranked number five and six by that particular subject. So moderately and similarly attractive options for this particular subject, basically. Suppose um, they choose that uh, CD, one of those two CDs, they would do some filling task, and after a while we would ask them to rank the CDs again based on their current feelings. The classic finding in this literature is that suppose they chose number five, a slightly better ranked option. Afterwards, they tend to give people tend to give better evaluation and even better rank for the chosen option and a worse rank for the rejected option. Why? Because after making a free choice, people tend to still think a little bit about, oh, did I really make the right choice? Um, and so their mind helps them solve that tension, resolve that tension by focusing on the positive features of the chosen option and negative features of the rejected option. So as a result, there is this spreading of alternatives to the fact, choice justification essentially. That's the paradigm we wanted to use. We simply added a little twist to it. So after people made a choice, we gave them a cleaning product to evaluate. So similar to the first package of studies, um, in this case is uh, not antiseptic wipes, but rather hand soap. And we asked them either to examine the product and evaluate it or use it and evaluate it. Okay. So we wanted to know how this cleansing manipulation right after free choice would influence the subsequent rankings of the CDs. On the y-axis is essentially the preference for the chosen option over the rejected option. So the rank difference between the two options. The higher the number, the stronger subject's preference is for the chosen option over the rejected option. What we found in the study was that if people simply examine the soap without using it, then they show the classic effect. After making the decision, post-decision, the yellow bar here, they show a stronger preference for the chosen option over the rejected option than before the decision, pre-decision. But if they actually use the soap, this increase in preference disappears. They are no longer showing choice justification. They are no longer showing this spreading of alternatives effect. And this two interactions suggest that cleansing seems to reduce the dissonance experience in free choice paradigms. And this idea of washing away post-decision of business has been replicated 
uh, with different materials and double sample size in our own study. We have a second study in our uh, paper. And also in other labs, especially when you look at people with low decisional anxiety. In contrast, if people have very high decisional anxiety, so if you always freak out after making a decision, did I really choose the right thing, then cleansing doesn't seem to show the same kind of effect, uh, probably because the anxiety is too strong, distance is too strong. And not just among North Americans, but um, also among Germans, other European participants have also shown similar effects. This kind of uh, finding suggests that dissonance in decision making can also be reduced by cleansing manipulation. Now, switching gear a little bit to fishy smell. So tactile experience of cleansing, switching that to the olfactory experience or smell experience of fishiness, okay? So I'm curious in this idea of fishy smells because English is not my first language. When I, when I learned more about metaphorical expressions and idioms in the English language, I realized you know, some of these idioms or expressions are really quite weird. Something smells fishy, like meaning something suspicious is going on, but why fishy? So then I got curious. I was like, okay, well, why don't we test that? Let's actually get people to smell something fishy to see if that might influence their behavior to some extent. So in the first experiment to test this idea, we used the classic trust game. So there were two decision makers in the trust game. In this case, uh, decision maker number one is the actual subject. Decision maker number two is a confederate, so not an actual subject, but subjects think that that's an actual subject, okay? So both of them uh, given $5 in the form of 20 quarters. And the subject could choose to send any amount of money to the confederate, $0, all $5, all 20 quarters, or any amount in between. And the um, interesting thing here, of course, is that whatever money the subject decides to send will be multiplied by a factor of four. So there is some you know, financial incentive to do so because the confederate then has the opportunity to give some money back to the subject. And again, the confederate could choose any of that amount to return to the subject. The idea here is that if the subject trusts the confederate, then the subject should send all $5, all 20 quarters, because that's, you know, multiplied going to be four times. So you can trust the confederate is going to return money to you. But if you're suspicious about the other person's motives, then you shouldn't send as much money because you might be ripped off. We did this task, and we simply manipulated the smell in the environment where this task happened. And this is a fun study for our research assistants, really. So there were three conditions. Uh, either the water condition, which was basically odorless, no particular smell, or fart spray, which basically smells like fart, and you can buy this product online. By the way, if you buy five of them, apparently you get a free gift uh, hoopy cushion, so if you're curious, or fishy smell. So the reason we included the fart spray is we want a negative smell, but non-fishy smell as a control condition. The fish oil, our research assistants have a ton of fun with it. So we cut open these fish oil capsules, and then we pour them in a little spray bottle, and in the actual experiment, um, while they were doing the trust game, a, an auto confederate would spray these uh, fishy smells in the environment with all knowing that that's part of the experiment, of course. Okay, so these three smell conditions. So let's look at what the findings were. Uh, y axis, how much money the subject would invest uh, in the trust game as a function of the three kinds of smell. If they smelled water, basically odorless, they invested quite a bit of the $5, 3.9. Uh, fart spray, 3.4, no significant difference between these two. But if they smell something fishy, they're investing less money than those in the water condition and also than those in the fart spray condition, suggesting that smelling something fishy seems to actually reduce um, the, the trust-based investment people would like to make in a trust game, right? Now, in another study, we tried to replicate, provide a conceptual replication of this idea. We used a public goods game, similar structure to this, um, but let me walk you through that anyway. Again, each investor, in this case, both investors are actual subjects. Each investor would be given $5 in the form of 20 quarters, and each of them could send any amount of money to the pool, the public pool. Whatever amount they send there would be multiplied by a factor of 1.8, so not four times, 1.8 this time, so a little bit less incentive, if you will. And then whatever is in the pool will be split half-half between the two investors, regardless of their initial investment in the pool. So. The idea is if you trust the other person to also invest, then you should send all your money to the public pool. Everyone benefits. 
But if, if you feel, yeah, I don't know about the other person, like I don't really trust the person, um, I'm suspicious about the motives, then if you send all your money, you're essentially losing a, a, you know, some of your money to the other person. So you don't want to do that, right? So that's the idea. Same cell, smell manipulation, water, phosphorus, and fish oil on the y-axis is, again, subject to investment. So here, we are finding essentially the same pattern. The fish oil uh, reduces the investment compared with both the water condition and the fox spray condition. Uh, I believe there's technical error in the slide because the numbers look identical to the numbers that you saw in study one. The pattern is the same, but the numbers were a little bit, should be a little bit different. So there might have been a technical glitch in the uh, showing the wrong slide. So I apologize for that. But basically in both studies, trust gain, public goods gain, fishy smell reduces trust-based investment. And then we got really excited about this idea. Well, what about the opposite? You know, so what we found so far is um, fishy smells increases suspicion, but what about suspicion increasing people's ability to identify fishy smell? Would that actually, would that kind of social suspicion actually change people's perceptual processing? That's what we wanted to look at. So uh, we did this really fun study. We, we gave people a bunch of smells to identify. So basically, uh, we presented these you know, five smells. They were in test tubes that were wrapped in aluminum foil, and subjects were asked to close their eyes, open the cap of the test tube, smell it, and then write down simply what they think it smells like, okay? So autumn apple, onion, creamy caramel, orange nectar, and fish oil. Um, so three of those were clearly positive. Onion and fish oil, depending on who you ask, some people actually like it, some others do not, but um, I wanted to have some sort of moderately uh, valence kind of smells. But uh, these are the things that they smelled and they had to identify them. But before they did, we added a twist. We manipulated suspicion or not. So for half of the subjects, we used suspicion by having the experimenter act a little bit weird, acting like we're trying to hide some real purpose of the experiment from the subjects, okay? And the other half of the subjects did not get this kind of suspicion induction. We wanted to know how or whether this suspicion induction might influence the ability to identify smells. So on the y-axis is the percentage of subjects who actually correctly identify the smell. So for fish oil, if they wrote down something like fish, fishy, or actually the kind you know, that was um, in the fish oil, then we would count those as correct. A similar idea for the other smells. So let's see what we found. If we induce suspicion, so the yellow bar here, then it improves people's ability to correctly identify the fishy smell compared with if suspicion was not induced. But this suspicion effect is specific to the fishy smell identification. It, it's not showing up in any of the other smells, okay? And so we were like, this is interesting, let's try and replicate it. So we did a couple of replication studies by changing the other smells. So we kept the fishy smell, but we moved it from the last position in previous study to a middle position. And we also changed things to garlic, cinnamon steak, autumn pumpkin, and fox spray. So some obviously negative smells involved here. Same pattern. Suspicion effect only showing fish oil. In other replication study, we also changed some of the other smells. Again, only the fish oil showing the suspicion effect. So I think this package of studies tell us that something smells fishy. It's a fun little linguistic metaphor, but it actually maps onto behaviors as well. To the extent that it can elicit suspicion, it reduces trust-based economic exchange in our own sets of experiments, but also in subsequent experiments by other labs. Uh, there's evidence that uh, this Lee is not me, by the way, so that's, that's why it's an auto lab. Uh, my grad school buddy, actually, they found that smelling something fishy enhances people's ability to detect misleading claims. So um, fake news, if you will, um, where do people detect that something might be fake? Well, that ability to, to detect errors, both in others' claims and in, in your own logical reasoning, confirmation bias in your own logical reasoning, that's enhanced by fishy smells. The idea being when you say fishy, something negative might be going on. You want to figure things out. So your, your mind is sort of signaling to you, oh, I should think a little bit more carefully about these things. So that's about fishy smells, influencing economic exchange and error, de uh, error detection. Finally, switching from these metaphorical meanings of wiping the slate clean, smelling something fishy, to the impact of overgeneralized feelings. 
So it's the power of sneezing and coughing in influencing people's risk perception and policy preference. So I got real interested in this when I was in graduate school, actually. Um, back in 2009, remember there was the swine flu pandemic, right? So the H1N1 swine flu pandemic. So this is a graph showing, a uh, map showing the cumulative cases in different countries back then. And this was in 2009, June uh, 11. And uh, during those several months, uh, from May to June to July, you see these cases just increasing all over the world, right? This was a map in July. Uh, essentially, all 50 states in the U.S., over 70 countries, there were 30,000 documented cases of H1N1, with 149, uh, 45 deaths worldwide within just a matter of two months. So in the middle of the swine flu pandemic, my collaborator and I got really curious what might happen when people simply hear or see somebody sneezing and coughing near them, would that kind of uh, fear of uh, you know swine flu generalize the feeling, the generalized feeling of uh, fear? Would, would that influence lots of different uh, risk perception, risk estimates? So that's what we wanted to do. So we did an experiment uh, on risk estimate and also evaluation of the healthcare system in the U.S. This was done in Michigan, where I went to graduate school. So uh, before they did the risk estimate and healthcare evaluation, we did this little sneaky thing. So a confederate, uh, 10 seconds before the subject was uh, approached by an experimenter with the questionnaire, 10 seconds prior to that, a confederate would walk past the subject, sneezing and coughing near them. Now, I, I should say, this is fake sneezing and coughing. So the confederate who did that was actually healthy, so there's no germs being spread at all. And it did get the IRB ethics uh, approval as well. So this is like a, you know, trying to act like sneezing and coughing, but it actually took some training to act it out in a realistic way uh, to see how that might influence people. And we measured a number of risk estimates, uh, several of them. First, contracting a serious disease. What we showed was that if people, subjects, walk past a confederate that was sneezing and coughing, they estimated high risks of contracting serious disease. And you could argue, well, you know, that's not too surprising. After all, there's a real uh, possibility that somebody might contract serious disease, in this case, swine flu, from sneezing and coughing. But what we're interested in is the overgeneralization of the feelings of risk, right? So we also measure these things that are arguably unrelated to swine flu, such as having a heart attack before 50 or dying from a crime or accident. And it turns out, people also estimated high risks of these unrelated incidents in their life if they simply have heard some disease and cough. And the two-way interaction here suggests, uh, uh, the absence of a two-way interaction here suggests that basically it doesn't matter what type of risk you look at. Sneezing just increases your risk estimate across the board. Then out of curiosity, we also looked at the evaluation of healthcare system in the U.S. So to what extent do you think it needs complete revamp, you know, uh, uh, completely revamping the healthcare system. And high scores means more positive evaluation. As you can see here, there's a trend where people who uh, walk past somebody sneezing and coughing evaluated the healthcare system less positively afterwards. So they have a more negative view of the whole healthcare system just because they've heard somebody sneeze and cough. Second study, we wanted to replicate this idea using different measures. So we looked at policy evaluation and evaluation of the entire country of the U.S. This time, uh, we had the experimenter uh, handing out a questionnaire, and after handing out a questionnaire, right before the subject was about to begin, the experimenter would sneeze and cough once, right? Again, this was fake sneezing and coughing, and, but it, it felt realistic to the subjects. So we took a uh, question from the New York Times CBS poll at the time. Uh, the question asked, basically, would you prefer the federal government to invest $1.3 billion in flu vaccine production, speeding up flu vaccine production, or in green jobs creation, right? Typically, people actually would uh, go for the green jobs creation. People care about the economy, but we manipulated whether the sneezing and coughing, uh, uh, you know, that would influence people's tendency to choose between these two things. Turns out, if they simply heard somebody sneeze and cough, they became a lot more likely to say, oh, we should invest that you know, $1.3 billion in flu vaccine production rather than on green jobs creation. To psychologists, you know, what's sort of interesting here is that 
it doesn't really matter what the magnitude of the federal sort of budget here is because it's all driven by feelings. If you could say five hundred to five hundred thousand dollars or one point three billion dollars. The idea is that people are very strongly biased by feelings at the moment, and they fail to correct for the influence of the feelings, and that's why you see this sort of dramatic increase in in people's uh, uh, policy evaluation or policy preference. Also, we ask people, well, do you think the country is going in the right direction or on the wrong track? Now, here, this was surprising to us. We actually don't find anything. So it's not the case that sneezing, uh, having heard somebody sneeze and cough, influence your evaluation of the entire country. It's, it appears to be somewhat domain bound, so to be related to risk kind of ideas. Uh, whereas, you know, whether the country is going in the right direction, that encompasses all kinds of things, politics and welfare and, you know, uh, uh, stability of the economy and so on. So so that doesn't seem to be influenced by sneezing and coughing, which is useful to know that there are some boundaries to these overgeneralization of feelings uh, still. Okay, so uh, this uh, theme of findings shows that risk perception and policy preference could be influenced by a mere sneeze and cough. Let me summarize what we've talked about today and then think about just a couple of um, big picture points. The four themes shows that cleansing, which you do every day, can help you with the flexibility in goal pursuit behavior and also help you regulate the dissonance in decision making, past decision making. Smells in the environment, especially if the smells have metaphorical meanings such as fishiness related to suspicion, can change people's metaphorical meanings uh, that are salient on their mind and therefore influence the economic exchange and improve their error detection ability. Finally, sneezing and coughing, helping people with risk, uh, influencing people's risk perception, if you want to call it a bias, you can, uh, also ch changes people's policy preference. All of these suggest that sensory cues have really interesting psychological power. They can trigger and shape motivated thinking where the goal pursuit or motivated you know, justification of your choice um, via metaphorical meanings like clean slate and fishy smells or via overgeneralized feelings. These disease cues, which are evolutionarily really important, uh, you know, back in the day, meaning for our species, catching the disease can easily kill you, right? And so it makes evolutionary sense that we are so sensitive to these things, but when you put that idea in the contemporary context, then these weird effects come out these you know, subtle disease cues can strongly bias your policy preferences. In conclusion, if you want to enhance people's productivity and innovation, you might want to manage what happens not only inside the head, the kind of information, the content that you present to them, uh, the words that you use, those are important, but so you might want to pay attention to what's going on outside the head in the physical environment or in the physical bodily state, because these things have predictable influence on their judgments and behaviors. Thank you very much, everyone, for paying attention to the webinar. So I'm happy to take lots of questions. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Spike. Um, so for everyone who is uh, still with us, uh, you can enter your questions on the chat tab. Um, and uh, put it in there, and I'll uh, I'll make sure to address your question. So uh, the first question, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so the first question is, um, so what what's next for your research? Um, what's what's kind of the next mind body interaction that you're going to be looking at? Yeah. So uh, one thing uh, I've been really interested in is how do we integrate lots of different physical influences into a coherent work. So I've talked about cleansing effects, um, I've talked about fishy effects, and so one level of analysis that I think is going deeper than just all metaphors all over the place is what I like to call the ground of procedure idea, right? So I try to analyze cleansing as a ground of procedure of separation, and there's actually a lot of work on um, different manipulations of physical separation. So our very own Professor Philip Silman here mm -hmm. has done fascinating work. I think in one of the studies, they, one of their uh, papers, they show that if people write uh, about sad events in their lives, they tend to feel more sad afterwards, so no surprise. But if they simply put that piece of paper on which they've written down the negative, uh, the sad thoughts, if they put that piece of paper in an envelope, simply by doing that, that act of physical separation 
reduces the influence of those sad ideas on their current feelings. And so it appears to me, and there are many other examples out there, it appears to me that any co-separation might help people activate this sense of psychological separation. And if that's the case, we can probably think about lots of daily life experience, daily behaviors. All behaviors involve some physical movement. Um, and so to what extent does this sort of basic dimension of physical separation versus physical connection help people tease things apart or connect things together, integrate or dissociate and so on, right? So that's the sort of exciting idea that I'm pursuing right now. Great, sounds interesting. Um, cool. So we just got another question. Um, from one of the participants uh, saying, uh, asking if there's any indication that uh, these manipulations may go beyond short-term decision-making in the moment uh, to longer-term behavior change over time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great question because obviously we want to see um, the extent to which these things actually play out in the real world, in the wild, right? Um, I have focused on developing theories by testing these ideas in the lab. But there are some indications that some of these effects do play out in the real world. So let's think about um, the clinical population for a second. So the most relevant clinical uh, syndrome that comes to mind is probably OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, mm -hmm. because in OCD, the most common symptom is fencing behavior. So over 50% of OCD patients, I think according to the U.S. data, uh, exhibit this kind of cleansing behavior. And they do this a lot, right? Uh, compulsively, obsessively. Uh, and another kind of um, behavior that is also the second most common is uh, checking locks and stoves. So security, basically. Checking if things are securely in place, in, in order. And I think that some of these ideas, uh, some of these uh, symptoms, behaviors, might be indicating a sense of exerting control over the environment. So uh, clinical psychologists have tried to study why cleansing behaviors, what exactly is about cleansing behavior here. Um, one um, framework, theoretical framework, suggests that when people have OCD, their security motivational system is like dysfunctional. So typically when you feel secure, like you're in a safe space, you know, everything is going okay, your mind stops worrying about things. But if that security motivationism is dysfunctional, it, it fails to send that kind of security signal, then you always try to regulate your anxiety. It's like always anxious, right? And so I, I think that, you know, our findings on separating past from the present, separating, you know, uh, whatever happened in, in your recent experience, oh, I touched something dirty, physically dirty, I need to wash my hands, um, may be part of the reason these sort of OCD patients might exhibit these behaviors. Now, we have yet to test this, but there, we have just yet to test whether separation is actually driving these effects. But we do know that um, in other work, looking at metaphorical effects of cleansing, like uh, physical cleansing reducing moral guilt, OCD patients actually show stronger effects. So to the extent that people in the real world, uh, some people in the real world care a lot about cleansing, these effects that we see in the lab can be amplified, right? Uh, so I think the key question is individual differences. When do these effects occur the most strongly, or you know, when do they not occur? Among what kinds of populations? To me, that's just a psychologically interesting question. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. So um, <clears throat> one kind of follow-up question. Um, so it's kind of the um, this question is it, it's stated as is the key cleansing or rituals. So I'm guessing. Um, you know, to what degree does um, habitual cleansing or, um, you know, have you looked at like uh, habitual use of behaviors um, versus kind of a one-shot behavior um, yeah. in, in the lab or, or otherwise? Yeah, that's, that's a, a really insightful comment there because I think there are three elements of um, three aspects of cleansing. And I focus today on just one of them, the separation aspect. The other two aspects are ritual and control. So when you are um, engaging in cleansing behavior, you have some control, direct control over the outcome of that. When you wash your hands, you know that some stuff is being washed away. You might not know exactly what it is, whether it's germs, particular kind of germs, you don't know, but you know some stuff is being washed away. So you are changing the outcome 
in some very direct way. That's one aspect. And the other aspect, uh, which was raised by this uh, uh, follow-up question, the ritualistic aspect of it. So people do this frequently, which is sort of why I get interested in this, this uh, phenomenon of cleansing as well, right? Because people do it every day, at least in contemporary life. It wasn't the case, by the way, um, in the history of the human species that, um, that we always did this kind of daily um, cleansing behavior or frequent cleansing behavior throughout the day, even taking a shower or taking a bath. Um, there were historical time points among certain cultures where people would not, you know, take any shower or bath for like days on end. So this sort of ritualistic um, frequent occurrence nature of, of cleansing behavior, I think is another uh, important aspect because there are other research suggesting that ritualistic behaviors in general help people downregulate some negative emotions, right? When people, uh, like you probably do this uh, kind of thing as well, when you're feeling anxious, you, I don't know, rub your hands or whatever. There are specific physical motions that people are used to doing, rituals, habits, and those manifest themselves when people are going through particular negative emotions. And so I, I suspect that that's part of the cleansing effects as well. Um, and then the separation idea of separating past and present. The reason I still think the separation uh, idea is important is because we have lots of evidence now in ongoing research looking at what other kinds of past experiences can be separate from the present by cleansing, and there are lots of them. And it's not clear to me, and, and those include both positive and negative experiences. It's not clear to me how the ritual account uh, and the control account will necessarily explain some of these findings. So uh, if people are curious, I can talk more about those, but you know, for the sake of time, I would just say yes, I think ritual is part of that, but I don't think it explains all of the findings that we have. Great, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, given, oh, there's, okay. Um, one second. I've been told that we have another question. Let me just make sure. Okay. I don't see it. Okay, yeah, um, so, Actually, there's another question. It's not showing up on mine, um, but it was sent to Liz. Um, okay. So are there any uh, studies that apply these concepts to, say, study habits, uh, self-discipline, and personal drive? Um, so this person uh, is, uh, gives an example of uh, that they're going to be designing some uh, minor behavioral nudges for a martial arts seminar. And a regular comment among participants is, I had a bad day. And uh, this person is wondering uh, what cues might set them up for success. Right. <laughs> uh, I love that. Um, not that I've tried martial arts, but I think it's, the idea is fascinating. Um, there, there's a related line of research uh, nowadays uh, on the idea of a fresh start. Um, so it turns out physical cues like cleansing can help people uh, create this sense of fresh start, right? but also non-physical cues. So like uh, abstract ideas like temporal landmarks. So think about the New Year's Day, for example. Every New Year's Day, even if you don't set New Year's resolutions, there is this very powerful sense that, yeah, I should think about, you know, how I want to make some changes, fresh start effect, right? Um, birthday or major landmarks, anniversary um, in a relationship, People often, and, and if you think about it in a metaphysical sort of sense, it's just another day, really. New Year's Day is no different from the day before, other than we label it as a temp temporally significant day. And so temporal landmarks matter, uh, and there are yet other behaviors or uh, ways of thinking out there that can help people frame these things. Um, so one tip that you can offer to uh, help people if they have a bad day is linguistically, or physically help them separate the past from the present. Now, uh, I'll give you one more concrete example. I have never done this kind of course myself, but I've watched YouTube videos about it. It's the um, neuro linguistic programming. I actually don't know how you know research based that whole thing is, but I've heard you know people who've done it like it apparently. And I, so I watched you know what is it all about the NLP neuro linguistic programming. And it's kind of funny, but at the same time, makes some intuitive sense. So one of those videos, 
the instructor. So there are these participants, right, who who were trying to, I guess, you know, resolve some emotional tensions. And so the instructor would ask them to do the following thing. So think about this this incident that made you really, really, really angry. Okay. And now think about the person who made you really angry. Now put that story in your left hand right now. So you're holding the story in your left hand. Now leave the story on the floor, take five steps back, walk around that, um, walk around this, look at it from different angles, and then like crush with your food or something, I don't know. So, but, but the basic idea is try to turn these abstract ideas, these narratives, stories, incidents, events, people into a concrete imaginary, in this case, uh, physical object, mm -hmm. and you manipulate people's physical experiences with the object. And that turns out to provide a very real sense of, of, you know, control over, oh, yeah, I think I can, I can see things differently now, or, yeah, I think I am the one who has the agency control uh, to exert uh, control over that. Some, some things like that appear to work. And um, so I would suggest uh, not just language, uh, but also this kind of thing. If you put those together, that's probably the most powerful combination, physical and linguistic cues. Yeah, and I think your example is very good for uh, for martial arts. That could be something that they could do at the uh, at the beginning of each of their sessions, potentially. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Maybe it's a warm up. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, we're coming to an end right here. Um, so yeah, so I guess uh, we'd like to thank Spike again for leading leading our webinar today. My pleasure. Uh, for those, yeah. A uh, full recording of this webinar, uh, for those who couldn't make it, uh, will be available at our website uh, by clicking the side tab labeled events and then clicking the sub tab labeled bear webinar series. Uh, and our next webinar will be April 11th. We will hear from Lisa Kramer, who's a professor of finance here at Rotman, who studies behavioral finance, which is uh, blending psychology and economics to study markets and financial decision making. Uh, it promises to be a very interesting discussion and we hope you all can join us. Uh, thanks again to Spike for leading our webinar, um, and thanks again for attending, everybody. Uh, you can now exit this webinar by closing your WebEx screen. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Have a good day.